And now, an eight original production. Winnie Ruth Judd is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. But you're here now with me and with those who love you. Never, never desert you no matter what happens. No matter what happens? No matter what happens. They called her the blonde butcher, the trunk murderess, the tiger woman, the velvet tigress. As the 30s dawned, the nation was gripped with this graphic tale out of Phoenix, a tale of murder and adultery, drug abuse, syphilis, slaughter, and dismemberment. The details of the crime are shocking, but what Arizona did to Winnie Ruth Judd is just as shocking. I'm Jana Boomer Spock. I reinvestigated the Winnie Ruth Judd case and wrote a book about it. A large trunk in the LA train station smells like death. Dark blood seeps from the scene, but when the trunk is opened, a surprise. The testimony is, what did you do next? I lifted the the lid of the trunk, and then what did you do? I, I um, uh, saw what uh, a blood-soaked uh, uh, comforter, and then what did you do? I lifted the comforter, and what did you see? I saw what I thought to be a woman's head. My name is Jerry Lukowitz, and my father defended Winnie Ruth Judd. Winnie with Judd went on trial for murder in Phoenix in January of 1932. She was accused of killing two women, Anne Leroy, whose complete body had been stuffed into a trunk, taken as her luggage to LA. She was never tried for the second woman, Hedvig Samuelson, known as Sammy, who had been cut into pieces. And her body parts were in the trunk and in Ruth Judd's hand luggage. At her trial, her attorney was Paul Schenk of Los Angeles with local attorneys Herman Lukowitz and Joe Zaversack. They called Joe Save Her Neck to be cute. There were rumors that her defense was being paid for by newspaper tycoon William Randolph Hearst. I don't think there's any doubt to it is that my father was paid by the Hearst newspapers. It sold a lot of papers, uh, that, that trial. Nobody had ever heard of Phoenix back in the, in the 20s and the 30s. Nobody. And then you had this grisly murder and this controversy. You know, it had sex, it had uh, intrigue, it had a, 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 what, a love triangle perhaps, you know, and murder. I mean, uh, and grisly. This was, this was the biggest news. This put Phoenix on the map a little bit. Judge Howard Speakman presided over the trial, and the prosecution was led by Lloyd Dogie Andrews. Crowds crammed into that little courtroom in downtown Phoenix, titillated at this woman who could butcher a friend. Winnie Ruth Judd had been the source of the largest manhunt in the history of the West at that point. She had escaped in LA after they found the trunks and hid out for a couple days and was eventually found at an L.A. funeral home where she gave herself up. During that time, she apparently wrote a confession about the killings and tried to throw it away, but it was recovered and brought to her trial. And there she was in Phoenix on trial for her life. And in everybody's mind was one incredible question. Did she do this alone? In 1973, the Dobkins book came out, and I was five years old. Um, and 
you know, if, if you've seen the cover of that book, there's a kind of a hand hanging out of a trunk. And as a small child, it's a strange thing when your mother says, this is your relative on the cover of this book. And um, so I'd always sort of thought of her as the body in the trunk as a small child. I'm Sunny Worrell, and I'm the great niece of Hedvig Samuelson. <laughs> Winnie Ruth Judd had been having an affair with a married man, which was totally taboo in those days. Jack Holleran, or Happy Jack as they called him, was a very successful, highly connected businessman in town. Ruth's husband, Dr. William Judd, was addicted to narcotics, and he traveled from place to place. Right now he was living in Los Angeles. Her husband, uh, who was a physician in Mexico, had a drug habit, which is Gosh, when you think of the 30s, now drugs are, you know, every time you pick up the paper, if some guy has marijuana, cocaine, whatever, in those days, the guy, can you imagine a physician was a drug addict in Mexico in the 30s? Her husband was told her to go back to Indiana for a while because he was having trouble keeping a job, and her car broke. She was going to L.A., and her car broke down in Phoenix. So she decided to stay in Phoenix. It's sort of... Odd how all that, just a car breaking down, can hinge on all of these things. But she decided to stay here, so she was alone. Her husband was a drug addict. Um, she was trying to support herself. They all were trying to get along the best way that they knew how. Winnie worked at the Gruno Clinic, along with Ann Leroy, who was the x-ray technician there. Ann had come to Arizona with Sammy from Alaska. Sammy discovered she had TB when she came back from her summer away. She thought that she had TB um, from the time that she was in Montana. It is very rainy in Juneau, and it's a very wet climate. So when they left Juneau, I believe that Sammy was the only one with TB. They traveled to Portland where she was, both of them had x-rays and Anne found that she had a touch of B TB also. And so they continued south to LA and they advised them to continue on to Phoenix, Arizona. So they came to Phoenix in the October of 1930. And for a while, Anne, Sammy, and Ruth all lived together in what would become the death house. By all appearances, Winnie, Anne, and Sammy were the best of friends. They were also an oddity in Phoenix because there weren't very many working women in town in those days. Most women were home with their husbands and their families. Jack Holleran had befriended them and sometimes brought business partners over to have a drink, even though it was prohibition, play some music. He entertained a little bit. All three women fell in love with him. Jealousy? Yeah, jealousy. They actually sold tickets to the death house at 10 cents a head, and thousands of people in Maricopa County traipsed through that house before police collected one shred of evidence. Thousands of feet had gone through every single room in that house, and only after that did police collect their blood evidence and their bone evidence and their layouts and all the other stuff they would present at the trial. By that time, of course, the scene had been totally manipulated and totally destroyed. But everybody wanted to see the place that Winnie Ruth Judd had done her dirty work. The prosecution claimed that Judd killed the two women as they slept in their bed. But if you looked at the evidence, you knew that wasn't true. But she never spoke in her own defense at her trial. Her defense was, she was insane. Maybe had she taken the stand, she might have been able to say something about individuals that might have, uh, have assisted her or participated or whatever, but uh, she didn't take the stand. In those days, the defense didn't have access to what the prosecution had gathered, so they had no way of knowing what the state's case was. They had to investigate on their own. But they did know is that Ruth Judd said she had fought them off in self-defense. Her hand was bandaged from a bullet wound, and she had photographs to show the bruises on her body to prove it, but nobody would believe it. 
this despite the fact that there was a witness who saw the state she was in when she took the trolley home after the murders. People have said, wait a minute, you know, why didn't your dad interview this uh, person or this witness or that one or uh, the preparation wasn't what, well, you didn't have the rules and, and uh, the discovery that uh, lawyers have today. Every day at her trial, people would notice that Winnie Ruth Judd sat there wrapping and unwrapping her bandaged hand. This is the hand that was wounded, she said, the night of the fight with the girls. And it was her proof, she said, that they had indeed engaged in this struggle with each other. The prosecution would claim she had shot herself in the hand later and used that only as an excuse. But I discovered in researching my book that the prosecution well knew that she had been wounded in the hand. The trolley driver had told them. He'd seen her. He'd seen the wound. He told them that. They never told anyone. They certainly never brought that up during her trial. Her biggest supporter was her brother, Burton, who actually had met her at the train depot in Los Angeles, knowing nothing about what was going on or the trouble his sister was in. But he would later move to Phoenix and spend hour after hour trying to get people to listen to her side of the story. Their parents moved out here from the Midwest, where they'd been preachers. They were penniless, but wanted to be near their daughter during her trial. Her family stood by her every second of the way. I'll have to say, I don't really understand or know why she never talked, you know. She, as, as the story goes, I mean, her view was it was self-defense and this other fellow came in and allegedly cut up the bodies because they were sort of surgically uh, dissected, if that's the word, uh, went on trial and she kept expecting, I've read, that they were going to come, this fellow was going to come forward and uh, uh, clear her name, as it were. Uh, he probably was from a very prominent family, had a future ahead of him, and was under great pressure, probably from family and others in the local establishment of the 1930s, to just keep his mouth shut. The defense probably did the insanity defense because that was one of Schenck's trademarks. He had made it very popular in California and thought it would work also in Arizona. But Arizona never did like following California's lead. A lot of people thought Winnie Ruth Judd was covering up for an accomplice. They didn't think that she was vicious enough to kill her two friends. They didn't think she was skilled enough to cut up the bodies or strong enough to lift those trunks. But the jurors said they wanted her to talk. So they convicted her of premeditated murder and sentenced her to hang. After her trial, the most unbelievable thing happened. Herman Lukowitz went to the court and asked for a new trial, claiming that his client had not been adequately represented by counsel, that indeed Schenck had been in charge of all of the decisions of the trial, and he had violently disagreed with him and thought that Winnie Ruth Judd had not gotten the representation that she deserved. My father enjoyed a very fine reputation. There used to be a joke about uh, uh, he, he'd be in the defense, criminal defense counsel. It, uh, it was in the paper once I read it. Uh, my father never told me, but there was a, uh, where if somebody was squabbling with their spouse, he'd say, you be good or look at you. <laughs> Maricopa County Sheriff John McFadden also didn't think the trial was fair and he eventually got Ruth Judd to tell the story. And she told a vicious story, a story of women trying to destroy each other because they all loved the same man. They were all trying to survive in the worst of times. The girls were mad at Ruth because she had introduced Jack Holler into a woman who they said had syphilis. They were gonna tell Jack and then he wouldn't like her anymore. She was gonna tell that they were lesbians and then he wouldn't like them anymore. And she was going to tell that Anne had tried to sabotage the x-ray machine at the Gruno Clinic. And then Anne would lose her job. And then nobody would have any money. And then everybody would be destroyed. It was a vicious, vicious fight. And in that fight, somebody got a gun. And at the end of it, two women were dead. I think it's debatable whether Sammy came out with the gun 